Quite often, chemists need to use solvents for all sorts of purposes, but not only do chemists use solvents, solvents are used in all sorts of industries, and even at home. But when you work with solvents in a chemistry lab, you gradually develop grudges against specific ones. And in some cases, they're so extreme, I would call them outright hatred. The solvents I'll be discussing in this video are solvents that I hate working with, and if you've ever worked with some of these solvents, I'm sure you'll hate them as well. First we have water. Water's a pretty bad solvent in organic chemistry, and even though sometimes that can be helpful for removing salts and byproducts from reactions, it's often undesired. Water also has a relatively high boiling point of 100, and it has the tendency to react with a lot of chemicals that you'd commonly work with in the lab. As such, water is a terrible solvent to work with, but it can be helpful for doing some washes. If I had a choice of doing a reaction in water, the only reason I would want to do it in water is because it's a greener alternative to some of the solvents that we use. So for that reason, I don't have a strong grudge against water, but it is pretty annoying. So we'll put it into C tier, which is appropriate, because there's a lot of water in the C. Now while water was the only solvent on here with no carbon in it, our next compound has but a single carbon, carbon disulfide. Carbon disulfide is extremely volatile and highly toxic, and it usually smells pretty bad. Another downside of carbon disulfide is it easily oxidizes in air, so it usually needs to be stored under an inert atmosphere. Carbon disulfide is highly toxic, especially with chronic exposure. It can cause neurotoxic effects, liver and kidney damage, and is harmful if inhaled or absorbed through the skin. It's definitely not something you want to be working with on a massive scale, because one small spill could result in a lot of exposure. Despite that, I've worked with carbon disulfide quite a lot, but it's always annoying to work with. Overall, if I had to choose to do a reaction in any of these solvents, carbon disulfide would not be my first choice. Carbon disulfide would probably be like my last choice or second last choice. So for that reason, I'm going to put it into A tier, because neurotoxicity, liver toxicity, and kidney toxicity. That's a lot of toxicity, and I've worked with enough carbon disulfide in my life. Next we have dimethylformamide. This is a relatively common solvent in organic chemistry, but it's important to note that it can explode if mixed with sodium hydride. There's quite a few reactions that use sodium hydride in dimethylformamide, and that's because it's a polar solvent which is very good at dissolving polar compounds, such as sodium hydride. However, sodium hydride is able to react with solvents such as DMF and DMSO, forming potentially explosive mixtures. If that wasn't bad enough, dimethylformamide is also a group 2A carcinogen, which means it's likely to cause cancer in humans. It also can cause liver damage and is a suspected teratogen. In addition, it's readily absorbed through the skin, making it particularly hazardous. DMF also has a strong unpleasant smell, which is pretty fishy. It also has the tendency to dissolve labels off of your NMR tubes and flasks, which is really annoying if you suddenly lose the label on your NMR tube. Thanks, DMF. If you're ever trying to purify something, like you had a reaction you were running in DMF and you needed to remove the solvent, you might do something called column chromatography. But if you do this with a really polar solvent system, like methanol dichloromethane, you'll end up eluding some of the DMF if you have a really polar compound that you're trying to purify. Effective separation can remove DMF, but it's pretty annoying because it's not that volatile, and it's dangerous around acids and bases. Furthermore, it's hygroscopic, and it's hard to wash out, but you can use lithium chloride saturated water to help. Overall, I really hate using DMF as a solvent, but there is some chemistry that just tends to need DMF to work well. So it's not my first choice, I would probably put it into S tier, because I definitely have a grudge against dimethylformamide, and I wouldn't work with this if I didn't have to. You might like acetic acid. Now we're not talking about that wimpy 5% that you might be putting on your salad. We're talking 100% acetic acid. Glacial acetic acid. Why is it glacial? Because it freezes. It also stings you on contact, and it stays behind when you try and evaporate it. It's pretty unfortunate, because acetic acid is actually a pretty good solvent for doing a lot of chemistry. If I had to choose between doing a reaction in acetic acid and DMF though, I would probably choose DMF, even though acetic acid is less toxic. I would just be worried about putting most chemicals into a pure acid solvent because acid-mediated chemistry might occur. Overall, acetic acid isn't one that I have too much of a grudge against, but when that smell just smacks you in the face so hard, it makes you want to take a break from the lab for a few hours. So for that reason, I'm going to put acetic acid into A tier, A for acetic acid. Another solvent of note is hexafluoroisopropanol. Despite my grudges against this chemical, I think it's a pretty good solvent. It's pretty good for doing chemistry under relatively mild conditions. Although it's really volatile as it has a low boiling point, but oftentimes a little bit of hexafluoroisopropanol will remain. This is because it forms extremely strong hydrogen bonds with hydrogen bond acceptors. If that wasn't bad enough, 
It's extremely toxic, as this can get metabolized into hexafluoroacetone, which is a teratogen. Hexafluoroisopropanol can cause severe respiratory and systemic effects. If that wasn't bad enough, it's also probably the most expensive solvent on this list. So for all of those reasons, we're going to put it into S tier, even though it's an S tier solvent as well. I have a grudge against it. There was this one time, I was making this compound, I'll include what it looked like here, and I could not remove the last bit of hexafluoroisopropanol from this for the life of me. What I ended up doing was I added methanol to it and evaporated it over and over and over until the peak in the fluorine NMR for the HFIP was almost gone completely, but I could never fully get rid of it. Similar to water, we have ethylene glycol. Ethylene glycol is a terrible solvent to work with because it's so viscous and it has a very high boiling point, so that makes it challenging to remove. The main type of reaction that you'll see done in ethylene glycol is probably a Wolf-Kishner reduction, but if you have any other reactions that you like doing in ethylene glycol, make sure you leave a comment down below. One of the downsides of ethylene glycol is if it's consumed, it gets converted in the body into oxalic acid, which is highly toxic if ingested, leading to metabolic acidosis, renal failure, and central nervous system effects. While this compound is less hazardous by inhalation or skin contact, it's still harmful. You can find ethylene glycol in antifreeze, but it's still not a great solvent to work with in most cases. High viscosity, high boiling point, and high toxicity makes this a very undesirable choice. This is another A-tier solvent that I absolutely have a grudge against. A similar looking molecule is dichloroethane. Dichloroethane is an extremely toxic solvent, and it's a known carcinogen. These two chloride groups can easily be kicked off of the molecule when part of your body reacts with it. It can cause liver, kidney, and lung damage. Inhalation can cause central nervous system effects, and long-term exposure may lead to cancer. In addition, because of the chlorines on the molecule, it ends up adding to ozone depletion. This is mostly through emissions from Southeast Asia, and we'll be talking more about this topic in an upcoming video about ozone depletion. It's not my first choice, it's highly toxic, and every time I worked with it, I was pretty scared about getting it on my skin. So for that reason, we're going to put dichloroethane into B tier. It's still pretty scary overall, but it has good properties as a solvent, so I don't have too much of a grudge against it. If it's given me cancer, it hasn't happened yet. Now what would happen if we took dichloroethane and reacted it with ethylene glycol? We would get dioxane, but dioxane can also be made from ethylene glycol directly. One of the downsides of 1,4-dioxane is its tendency to freeze close to room temperature. It also forms explosive peroxides, and it's a possible carcinogen in humans. One of the downsides to 1,4-dioxane is that when you're doing separations, it might not be clear whether your 1,4-dioxane is in the aqueous or organic layer, or more likely both. This can be really frustrating when you're doing purifications, because if there's a lot of this in the aqueous layer, it might dissolve some of your compounds into that layer as well. Another pain point that I have, quite literally, with 1,4-dioxane is it smells like spicy diethyl ether, and not the good kind of spicy. Some inorganic chemists will be preparing complexes and oftentimes THF or 1,4-dioxane are included in the crystal structure. This might be desirable if you're trying to get crystals for a publication, but it might be really annoying if it's disrupting your complexes and you want to build a very specific ligand system. 1,4-dioxane, again, not my first choice. I'd probably put it into B tier overall. I do have a grudge against it. It does form peroxides, but it still evaporates relatively easily. And as long as you're not doing super cold chemistry, it's probably well suited for 1,4-dioxane. Acetone. Acetone's a pretty good solvent. The downside of acetone is it reacts with a lot of acids and bases, and it's also miscible with water. Again, that means if you're doing an extraction, you're going to have to be careful where your aqueous and organic layers are, and you might need to use a large excess of solvent like diethyl ether or dichloromethane to make sure that you extract all of your product. Acetone can be an okay solvent for some alkylation reactions, but oftentimes you see DMF used instead. Despite these issues, acetone is fairly liked as a solvent, so I think we can put it into F tier because this is one of the best solvents that we have overall. When I think about how much glassware I've washed with acetone, I imagine that I've probably used at least 400 liters of acetone washing stuff in my time as a chemist. That's a lot of acetone. Just don't go drinking any of it. And that applies to all of these solvents for that matter. Similar to DMF, we have DMSO. DMSO isn't toxic like DMF, and some medications are even dissolved in DMSO so that the drugs can be absorbed more easily. DMSO is the solvent you go to when your compounds won't dissolve in anything else. Much like DMF, it has a really high boiling point, and it's incompatible with sodium hydride, as I mentioned earlier. Another downside to DMSO is it has a really foul smell, likely due to some impurities present, and if you get some on your skin, apparently it makes you smell like garlic for days. I haven't tried this yet, but if you have any garlic smell stories, I'd love to hear more down in the comments. DMSO is also hard to remove in extractions, 
since it tends to be miscible with almost anything. But it isn't miscible with diethyl ether, so it's possible to do extractions from an aqueous layer containing DMSO using diethyl ether. But a small amount of it will still get transferred to the ether layer, and it's often necessary to do column chromatography to remove the last traces of DMSO. Overall, chemists hate working with DMSO, so we can put it into S tier, which is appropriate. S for sulfoxide. One of my biggest grudges on this whole list is definitely pyridine. Sometimes pyridine is used as a solvent, and when you use that much pyridine, you develop a hatred for pyridine. It smells terrible, and I've heard a lot of rumors from chemists saying that it's teratogenic in men, meaning that it would cause birth defects, but I haven't been able to find any science backing this up. Yeah, like, you actually have to go out of your way to be that stupid on the topic than you would just spending a couple of seconds looking it up. Pyridine also has a really high boiling point, and typically the only way that I've found to remove it completely is to add toluene and evaporate down my compound over and over until no pyridine smell is left. Column chromatography often does a pretty good job of removing pyridine, but if you have relatively non-polar compounds, the pyridine may co-elute and come off of the column at the same time as your product, meaning that chromatography didn't do any separation, which is like the one thing it's supposed to do. I think the only form of separation that chromatography really achieves is separating you from your friends and family. Pyridine is toxic by ingestion, inhalation, and skin contact. It can cause liver and kidney damage, and is irritating to the respiratory tract and skin. It also has this disgusting fishy smell that I absolutely hate, and no matter how well I would seal my bottles of pyridine, I would always smell pyridine whenever I open the cabinet in our lab. I hate pyridine, it can go right into S tier. It does still have some uses as a solvent, it's a little bit polar which is nice, and the lone pair on the nitrogen can help it form Lewis complexes, it can act as a ligand, and it can also scrub bases from a reaction. I definitely have a grudge against pyridine. You might not have a grudge against propionitrile, but you'd be surprised to hear that it's about as toxic as hydrogen cyanide. Oftentimes people use propionitrile when acetonitrile fails for their chemistry. Acetonitrile is nowhere near as toxic as hydrogen cyanide, but surprisingly propionitrile is. This is why it's always important to look at the safety data sheet of the chemicals you're working with before working with them, especially the first time you work with them. Let's say Jimmy goes to the lab. If your name's Jimmy, I'm sorry for calling you out. If your name's Jimmy and you've worked with propionitrile, this story literally is you. You work with this, you get a bit of it on your arm. You think nothing of it, you go home. If you don't want to be in the next Chubby Emu video, you better read your safety data sheets. The LD50 of propionitrile is 39 milligrams per kilogram. That's pretty potent. For reference, sodium cyanide has an LD50 for rats of about 6.4 milligrams per kilogram, while the LD50 in rats for acetonitrile is 2,460 milligrams per kilogram. So propionitrile is actually quite toxic. For that reason, I will always have a permanent grudge against propionitrile, since it's so friggin toxic. It can also go right into S tier. Last but not least, we have diisopropyl ether. I haven't had the pleasure or displeasure of working with diisopropyl ether, but because of these two CHs right adjacent to this oxygen, this compound has a propensity to form peroxides. This is probably the most notorious peroxide forming chemical in the entire research lab. When peroxides start forming, because it's a chain reaction, it gets faster and faster and faster. And there's no shortage of horror stories where an old bottle of this was discovered in a lab, completely caked in white crystals. If you see any solvent which could form peroxides caked in white crystals, don't touch it, let your supervisor know, and make sure that EH and S, or a bomb team, are able to deal with it. Since it's diisopropyl ether, I think we can put it into D tier because you might die. So these were some of the solvents that I have strong grudges against. I would definitely prefer to wash stuff with acetone than with DMF. And if I could avoid using hexafluoroisopropanol, I would definitely try to avoid it. As you can see, safety considerations are always something worth considering when you're doing chemistry. You should read into the chemicals that you're working with before working with them to make sure that your next experiment isn't your last experiment. Hopefully this isn't the last video of mine you watch either. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.